So, um, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this guest lecture um, in this course, Recommender Systems, uh, that, that I'm teaching in the summer quarter at University of Washington, Seattle. So, we have with us um, the amazing Khalife Al Jada. Uh, he holds a PhD in computer science from the University of Georgia, UGA, with a specialization in machine learning. He's, exper he's experienced implementing large scale distributed machine learning algorithms to solve challenging problems in domains ranging from bioinformatics to search and recommendation engines. Um, in the previous role, he was a senior director of online data science at Home Depot. And before that, he was also leading a data science team at Carrier Builder. Right now, he's the director of data science at Google. And uh, 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 Dr. Khalife has a lot of experience in working on recommendation system technologies. Um, and he's also the founder and organizer of the Southern Data Science Conference uh, which is a major data science conference in Atlanta. Uh, he's also a co-founder of nonprofit organization, Athletics. So it's a pretty impressive uh, resume, and we are very excited to have you, Khalife, uh, to this guest lecture. Thank you for thank joining. you, Karthi. Thank you for having me, and I'm excited to join you and your class today to talk about some interesting aspects of the recommender systems. And uh, to start with a disclosure, like all the work I'm going to present today. That was done when I was leading the online data science team at Home Depot, which is the fifth largest e-commerce platform in the US. So very interesting use cases there on the recommender systems. And we're going to talk about some of the uh, uh, interesting solutions that we worked on from the data science perspective to help the customers find what they're looking for uh, in a frictionless experience. And uh, all the work that you will see in the slides actually got uh, already published, either as research papers or um, discussed in some industry talks. Um, and then like the same talk was uh, part of the GTC 2022. I presented this work at the NVIDIA GTC conference this year. And with that, uh, we can get started. Uh, do we have everyone, Karthik? Can we go ahead and start now? OK. So we can get started. The talk is about building AI-based recommender system, leveraging the power of deep learning and GPU. And as you can uh, tell from the title, like the focus is really on the advanced uh, AI techniques used with advanced infrastructure, including the GPUs to enable uh, recommender system at large scale. All right. Uh, so I think Karthik gave you an idea about, or, or a, a brief summary about my, uh, uh, my journey. But currently, I'm director of data science at Google. Before that, was senior director of the online data science at Home Depot, um, and I serve I serve as uh, on, on the advisory board of the computer science department at UGA, which is my alma mater, University of Georgia, and uh, on the advisory board of the School of Computer Data Science and Analytics at Kennesaw State University. And I'm proud of being a co-founder of a nonprofit organization, Atlanta Analytics for Community Service, and a proud founder of the Southern Data Science Conference, which was the very first local data science conference in the Atlanta area. OK, and uh, with that, we can now get to the fun stuff. So when you talk about e-commerce, we talk about a very interesting story of multimodality. So if you go to any product information page on a, on a typical e-commerce website, what you would see is the following. You would see a product image. And you know, this is visual data, right? And then you will see uh, a table that summarizes the important attributes of that product. And that's tabular data, structured data. And then you will also see if the product has different colors, it comes in different colors, you will see those swatches that shows the different the variation of colors and that's another aspect of visual data that you have then when you scroll down you will see a lot of customer reviews and ratings and that's another like text data that you have and then you have the product title and description another piece of text data and then behind the scene you have all the actions the click stream data what the customer clicked on the uh, add to cart you know the the, the purchase all of those like customer behavior and data. So if you take all these modalities in the, that you have in the e-commerce, it becomes like obvious that you have a very rich domain of data assets. 
And in order to build a strong recommender system, someone needs really to think deep on how to leverage all these data assets that you have to solve different customer needs through recommender systems. And that's what we're gonna focus on in this talk today. It's really like you will see different problems, different aspects of recommender systems or, 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 uh, or parts of the recommender system that you build to solve different customer problems and, and, and to satisfy different customer needs. And this is something really interesting. When I moved from Career Builder, which is like a, recruit, a recruitment uh, domain, um, to the e-commerce, I was surprised because when, when I was working in the recruitment domain, mainly you have to solve for kind of two types of problem. Either a recruiter is trying to find the right job seekers, the right candidates. So you need to recommend the right candidates based on the job posting for the recruiter. And on the other hand, if the job seeker is on the website, you need to recommend the right jobs to the job seeker that satisfy their need, right? So that's kind of the two types of recommendations that you build. But when you come to the e-commerce, then you find like a wide range of needs. It's not just two types of recommendations. And we're gonna see like those, uh, some of those types today in, in the talk. So if you go to the next slide, and we're gonna start with this very interesting problem that we in the home improvement industry when I was at Home Depot face, which is sometimes people come to the website and they're shopping for table lamp or sofa or carpet. They find something that they like. And now the question, how should you help them find all the similar items that you have in the catalog without them going and searching for those items individually on the website. So basically what you, wanna, what you wanna do is, the problem that we try to solve here, a customer likes something visually. So they like maybe the, the look, the color, the color finishing, the style of the item. And they would like now to find all the similar ones, the visually similar ones on the catalog. So they can actually expand their, um, expand the, their, their horizon and they can find, um, wide range of items that they can shop from instead of just single item. And this work was published, part of, the, of this work was published at uh, a workshop at KDD 21. And the, the title, the paper title is Scalable Framework for Product Image Classification Applied to Home Improvement E-Commerce. Cool, let's move to the next slide. All right, so here's an example from Home Depot website. If you look at the uh, image here, which has the more like this. So this is the experience that you see in Home Depot website when you shop for table lamp, for example. Once you scroll on the product uh, information page, you would see there is this section of the page called more like this. And this is behind the scene powered by the algorithm that I'm gonna talk to you about today in the next few slides. So how do we figure out that those three table lamps next to the one are the visually similar ones uh, to, to, the, to the anchor product? And with the lower example of with the ceiling fan, how do we know that those three ceiling fans out of the millions of products exist in the catalog are the best three ones that are similar to the anchor product to show to the customer, right? So the, the pipeline that we built to, in order to identify those visually similar products, it includes an image classifier as a step one, step two, extracting visual features, and step three, compute the similarity between images, and then step four, optimize the ways. Now we're gonna talk about those um, the steps one by one. So if you move to the next slide, okay. The first thing is the image classifier. The question is, okay, so I'm trying to find similar images, right? Or identify similar products, visually similar products. Why do I need image classifier or image type classifier basically? Here's the challenge. If you have two products that are chairs, A and B, and if you'd like now to take the image of product A, a chair and the image of product B, Let's say product A, the image was silo with white background. Product B, on the other hand, the chair was 
a lifestyle image, which means like it doesn't have white background. It was taken in a room. And it was with angle. It wasn't like front image, right? So if you take those two images now, if A and B are very similar to chair, even if they're the same chair, but those two images, one with white background, one without, one with an angle and one that was a front, and you try to compare them, you will end up with, no, they're not similar, right? The image similarity will not be high enough to say that they are similar. So that's why the image type classifier was very important step one in the pipeline, because what you want to do is you want to make sure when you compare two images, you're comparing apple to apple. I'm comparing two silo images with white background. I'm comparing two lifestyle images. I'm comparing images with angle. I'm comparing images front with, from the front side and so on. So the image type classifier, you can see on the screen, we have like the right side and the left side of the slide. On the right side, we're showing you behind the scene, the training pipeline, how the training pipeline looks like. So we used absolutely human to label the similar images, first of all, to, to generate training data. And then we created an ontology. We're going to talk about that ontology shortly. And that ontology is, is there to serve the purpose of how many different image type classes do we have? And we're going to see like how many, there are really many of them. And then after that, you train a model. And then after you train the model and you validate and test, then it comes to, is the classifier now strong enough or not? And if, if the classifier is not strong enough, then you need to retrain it with more examples. And that's where the active learning comes into the picture, where we do the offline evaluation. And if the classifier is not strong enough, then we label more examples and we try to train the classifier again. And so on until we reach the level which we are satisfied with in inaccuracy. But the left hand side though, is what do we do in the production? How do we use this classi those classifiers after we train them? So basically you get an input image, you send it to the uh, image type classifier, the ITC production pipeline, Basically, you call or you invoke the right classifiers in this case, and then the classification of the image is going to come out, and then you take that classification and then you send it to the application layer. And the application layer could be the visually similar recommendation, could be the line art, could be the visual search, whatever. So if you go to the next slide, here is what we call one of the ontologies, which is content ontology and the content ontology i just talked to you about like is this a silo image and if it is a silo image is it white background or a non-white background so this is kind of one of the hierarchy of the classes then there is no it is not silo it is lifestyle okay is it lifestyle full scene is it lifestyle limited scene is it lifestyle product and then there is another content which is annotation which means is this image appear with an annotation, comes with an annotation. And then there is close up and there, there is a swatch sample and there is sit. So all those like classes and subclasses or hierarchy of classes, those represent or what we refer to as an ontology of classes that represent the image type. So before you take an image and you compare it with another image to say, are they similar or not? You have to make sure that they belong to the same hierarchy of classes. So I cannot take a silo image white background, as I just said, with a sit image or with a image that has dimensions or an image that has infographics because the similarity score will not be good, if, even if they are similar. Okay, if we go to the next, and then there is the views ontology that evolves actually from silo. Even if the image is silo, there are like plenty of uh, views for the image. The orientation, the horizontal angle, the vertical angle, the distance, the resolution, the visibility, all of those are another like hierarchy or set of classes that, um, that, that we identified in order to classify an image and make sure that when we say image A and image B, they are actually apple to apple. Any questions so far? I should pause here. Yeah, uh, okay. quick question, Khalifa. Is it okay if we can ask questions in the middle of the... A talk is that yes, I want this to be interactive. So please let's 
Uh, okay, great. Stop, Paul, like stop me, whatever, just, just ask a question if, if anyone has a question. Okay, I'll get us started. So uh, the under, my understanding here from what you shared, Khalifa, is that uh, the view similarities that we are looking at is very fine grained. So it's yes. more of like a buying decision that people want to make. So is it left aligned, right aligned? So is that is that like a correct uh, understanding of what we are looking at? And second follow-up is, uh, would text description of these products help give any signal for the kind of view similarity that we care about in this context? Yeah, two great questions. The, the first one, yeah, yes, what, what ultimately you want to do, it's not about what people are looking for. It's about uh, if the product image that's appear on the website is the image, for example, that was taken from distance, then when I need to, when I need to identify what are the other similar products that I should show as a recommendation, I need to take that view into consideration and look at what are the other products that have a distance view to measure similarity. Because if I take a close-up image and I try to measure to uh, measure its similarity with a distance image, they will not look the same from the uh, embedding perspective when we come to the extracting features. So that's that's the whole idea is here is that the ontologies, the view ontologies and the content ontologies, they try to identify how typical are the images from the content and view perspective in order to be sent to major similarity between them. So before we go to major similarity prerequisite, they need to be typical from the view perspective and from the content perspective. Then if the similar, if the visual similarity um, model said they are not similar, then we know they are not similar. The, the, the product itself, they're not similar in this case, not the angle, not the view, not the, the content. But if we don't take this pre-step, then if the classifier said they are not similar, it could be that the view is not similar or the content is not similar, but actually it is similar to the product. So that's the, that's the first question. And the second one um, uh, about the uh, text uh, description of the, of the product, the next project we're gonna talk about we actually leverage the text as well to build a multimodal model that actually leverage the image and the text, but to solve different problems. For this one, the focus mainly here is the visual similarity. So that's why we did not even look at the text description or title. We take just the images and we try to identify the similarity from the visual aspects of the product based on the images only. All right, any other question guys? And so these similarity scores that we build will be used downstream for any other tasks, right? Exactly, exactly. It has to be, it has to satisfy these two criteria that it has to be similar in a view uh, and, uh, and content. content. Okay. Right, right. If you have a question, just unmute yourself, please, and ask directly. So don't hesitate to do that. All right. Um, then let's go move to the next slide. Oh, hi, Dr. Jai. Sorry to interrupt. Can I ask a question, please? Please, go ahead. Yeah, so you mentioned earlier that um, this all these images need to be classified based on the image ontology first, for example, like on what angles or what backgrounds uh, in order to uh, classify in, the, in order to compare their similarities. So does this classifying process be done via human or is it still um, done still with some algorithms? No, here's the algorithm in this slide, the methodology. So okay. we, we, annotate, we annotate this the images with their um, view and with their content. We annotate some images using um, human annotators. And then we train a classifier like this to identify if those two images belong to the same class, view class or content class or not. Okay, so, so basically the first classifier is give me an image and I'm gonna tell you if they if this image belong to class to the content class silo, white background, or if this image belongs to the class, uh, for example, lifestyle and full scene lifestyle. So this is in this slide. This is the classifier that we trained for that job. And as you can see here in this slide, um, so if I take now the uh, scenario one and scenario two. So if you take now two images and you send them to the classifier, what we did first of all is we take a convolutional neural network full, and, and then we alter the, uh, that convolutional neural network with a fully connected layer. So that's what like 
you know, this is now like the, the best practice in the industry is you don't reinvent the wheel, you don't turn everything from scratch, you take a pre-trained model. And what you do is basically you kind of alter that or you, you, you make some changes to uh, add some of the advanced layers in the network to do your, the task that you're looking for. So basically what you do is you take, you take two images and you send them to this uh, CNN. And the CNN in this case, would actually try to, based on the annotation, the annotated data, it's gonna tell you if those two images belong to the same content class or view class or not, right? But then what we figure out, for example, is that the uh, representation of the image that comes from the CNN, sometimes it is struggle and it can be much, uh, or it can receive so much help if we basically, enrich it with features from traditional computer vision. For example, the, um, the percentage of the white uh, color in the image, that, that, that helps a lot, for example, identify if there is white background or not, right? And it is like some of those standard traditional computer vision, uh, the distance from the edge and things like that. So what we did in this case, it's <clears throat> you have the convolution neural network there, sitting there, but in, on top of that, actually, we also added another um, uh, traditional computer vision features that we enrich. And then the outcome of the convolutional neural network and the new traditional computer vision features, you can take now the output of the scene as a feature by itself. Then you feed all of that to the XGBoost classifier. And the XGBoost classifier is going to actually then spit out the uh, multi-label classification of the image. So, it's not just you rely now on the uh, neural network because the neural network generates the embedding of the image and it's, it's good absolutely to, to generate the representation of the image. To, for some classes, it works fine, but for other classes, the traditional computer vision features actually helped a lot. So that's why you say that it is like two levels or two layers of classification where there is the CNN, but then you take the output of the CNN and you consider it as a feature now and then you enrich it with traditional computer vision features and all of that goes to XGBoost. And then the XGBoost classifier is the one that decide which classes this image belongs to from the content and the view from the hierarchy. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's the methodology to on, on, on the automated uh, classification system that actually take an image and tell you which class it belongs to. Now, the question is, do we need to train one classifier or multiple classifiers, right? And that's, that was an interesting question. And the answer was for some generic classes like silo lifestyle, all the products usually have those two classes. So you can train a generic classifier for those two classes that can take a, a product from any category, from appliances, from furniture, uh, from the lighting, from ceiling fan, any category. And the classifier should be generic enough to identify if this image is silo or lifestyle. But then there are some categories that have its own specific classes that only applies to that category. And what one example is in the appliances, there's like the, uh, if you notice in the refrigerator, like there is the open view of the refrigerator, there is a closed view of the refrigerator, right? when the doors are open of the refrigerator and they are closed. So this class only applies to the refrigerator. So I don't need to bother to train a generic classifier for the power tools for that class, open or closed, because there is no images on the power tools that are gonna come with that type, right? So for that reason, we created like two types of classifiers. There's generic classifier, which are for the generic classes. And there are also specific classifiers for specific categories. So that's why we end up with multiple classifiers, not a single generic classifier for all the categories. Go ahead, Karthi. This is like uh, breaking down hierarchical classification, right? You're making your two steps, like higher level class, and then within that pinpoint, mm -hmm. the subclass of yes. the... So, and, and the number of classifiers ideally is the size of the ontology, right? For the views and the content. Um, yeah, like the, the maximum number of classes, yes, that's yeah, the, yeah. Okay. the number of yeah, nodes in the ontology. But that would yep. be that you may not have enough data for all of those, so you break it down into these steps and uh, yep. kind of 
top down approach to narrowing down. down. Approach. Yeah, great. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. And we're going to see like some examples in the next slides, like how does that work? So if we move to the next slide, here you see this is an example of like how we apply active learning to improve. So when you have that number of classes and you have millions of products in your catalog with images, then the question is, do you want to really like how many should you label to build the strong classifiers, right? And you don't want to like go ahead and label so many images because it's expensive process and it is time consuming a process. So you don't want to spend a lot of money labeling or annotating so many images. <clears throat> if those images at the end actually will, will not like maybe after 1000 images or 10,000 images, you will reach the level of accuracy that you're happy with. So why would you go and annotate 100,000 images, right? So that's kind of the benefit of thinking on the active learning approach where you start with a small set of annotated data, you train classifier, and then that classifier, you basically send it unlabeled data and you try to classify those unlabeled data or, or images with that classifier. Then the labels that generated or came from the classifier will be sent back to the human annotators to validate. And once they validate, they will identify the ones that are wrong. And then you know where the classifier struggle. Does it struggle with the, with the uh, silo images, with the lifestyle images? And for that class, then you annotate more images. And then you send the, tra the, in the training data plus the new examples again to train a new version of the classifier. And then you keep repeating until you reach a level where you are happy with the accuracy level across all the classes that you're training for. So that's in this way or following this approach of active learning, you label really like the, the, the minimal that can take you to the accuracy level that you're happy with instead of annotating beforehand tons of images while you don't know if those images are the ones that the classifier would benefit from or not, right, from the beginning. So this so is cost and time, right, of and yes. which is very, which is a lot of cost. Exactly, it is saving cost and time, of course, and it is a very, very important aspect when you train, especially for computer vision, because it's expensive task to annotate images. All right, so that's the pipeline of the active learning, and then if we go to the next slide. This is how the production pipeline would work. So what you would do is you would take image one, image two, image three, and image one from the metadata of the product that it belongs to, we know that this product is from category X or category Y. Then you have the product SKU number, and then you have the image ID. So I send this information, and then based on the category which the product belongs to, what you would do is you, you would call if it is area rack, then you would send it to the area rack classifiers. And then you would send it to the generic classifier that we talked about, which is like the classifiers that across all, all the categories. If it is appliances, then you will call the appliances classifiers. And then you will call the all categories of the generic classifiers. Then after you're calling those, all these classifiers that apply for this image, you will get at the end the output as in the uh, box at the bottom that tells you for image one from category X, product SKU, blah, blah. For classifier one, it classified as silo, not lifestyle. For classifier six, it is actually front to view, right? And this is this data or this, this in, in, uh, class, classification results now got stored with the image as metadata of the image. And then what happened then in the downstream applications if any application would like now to, you, to know what content and what view is this image from, they can basically go to this uh, database and retrieve the classification because it's already it's batched, batched processed. It's not like in real time. It's batch processed and the image now has the, this metadata. Um, now, this process, it was scheduled to update on a weekly basis, which means like Every week, we'd go see if there are new images that get added into the catalog. And then you would run a batch processing to classify them using this pipeline. And then it's get it stored, and then you can leverage it later on. All right, now if you go move to the next slide. So quick uh, question. Uh, sure. It, so, it's, it, so this looks doesn't look like multi-class. It looks like one, multiple one versus all. Is that is my understanding correct on the top level categories? 
I think it's it's multi-label. Multi-label. Uh, yeah, multi-label classifier. Okay. Yeah. And here is the after you identify which class the images belong to, as we said. Now, from that database, which has image X is a front, a silo from category A. Then image B is from category A, it is a front, it is silo. Then now I can take those two images who have the same view, the same content, right? But I don't know if they are the same product or not, or similar products. And then I come to measure the similarity. And measuring the similarity here means, okay, I need now to extract the visual features of the image. And in order to do that, you take the image of the product. And again, in our case, we were always looking for if there is a silo white background product, those tends to be the best in order to extract the visual features. So once you identify those images, you send them to this pipeline or this model. And as you see here, it's, it's, it's a typical convolutional neural network, um, which again was pre-trained. And what we did is basically just freeze and chop layers from that network. And, and in order to train it for the similarity between images. So basically it's, 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 it's a standard convolutional network that was uh, ID customized to measure the similarity between images, trained to measure similarity between images. So once you get the vectors out of this network that represent the images, and again, like it's, it represent the, uh, it, it was a trained to, to, to uh, measure similarity between images. Now, the question is, how would you measure similarity between those like millions of vectors, right? So each image got converted into a vector now and the vector now represent the uh, visual features of that image. And the visual feature in this case, again, like if it's the color, it is the style, the color finishing. So the question now, you have millions of vectors. How should you measure similarity between them? If you wanna do like uh, a matrix, million by million, you're talking about billion uh, computations that you need to do, right? So what should what did we do? If we move to the next slide, in order to do to run that KNN process, KNN's neighbor at larger scale between the query vector of, uh, of image and the pool of other images in order to know which ones are similar to it, we actually looked at different approximate KNN algorithm or libraries that was open sourced. So the ones that we actually uh, evaluated for the task, one of them was FACE from the Facebook research. One of them was ANNOY from Spotify. Another of them was NMSLib. And the one in our case that actually outperformed from the accuracy and speed perspective was the NMSLib. So, as a large scale Canon library where you can take a vector and you wanna compare it to millions of other vectors to see which ones are the most similar ones, uh, NMSLib did a did, uh, good job. So we end up using NMSLib in this case. And again, it's basically taken two vectors and try to measure the cosine similarity, whatever similarity uh, measurement you wanna have and identify the top and similar ones to that vector that you have. Mm -hmm. How frequently do we need to make this computation? Um, like, uh, I guess, uh, you know, based on the frequency of uh, embeddings being updated, right? But just curious for Home Depot. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we cannot like tell exactly like how many victories you compare. So it was in terms of millions, but yes. So every week when we run that pipeline to uh, classify the new images, all the new images then in order to identify their similar uh, images, they need to go through this uh, process of a vector versus millions of other vectors in the pool. So, but, but, but the old images are, I mean, the, the ones that we only have similarities for, we keep it as it is for some time, right? And update it yes, yes. less frequently. Right, 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 right. I think it was like, you need to be pragmatic in this case. So if you have enough recommendation for a product A, then maybe you don't need to worry much about updating the recommendation frequently. But if I have product B and I don't have enough recommendation from the previous batches, then I would go and pick pro product B in this case and see after I added the new images, if I can add, enrich the recommendation, have more 
recommendation available for product B. So if the product already have enough recommendations from a previous run, uh, previous batch processing, I don't worry about updating those on a weekly basis. Maybe I would wait for two weeks before I update them. But if I have a product that doesn't have, then as soon as I have a new images available, I would run the process for that product to see if I can identify more recommendations. Any other question? Okay, cool. And by the way, like for, for uh, before we go to this, about talking about the same, um, like uh, computing the similarity, for some of the use cases, you have to do this in real time. And we're gonna talk about one of those use cases in, in the next slides. For some use cases, you have to do this in real time. Why? While the, um, user is in the session and you have a victory representation now you need to find the similar products in real time and then you need to run this one versus million of victors similarity or knn process in real time which means in, in less than 30 milliseconds you need to come up with an answer of what are the similar victors that represent the products similar to this product or complement products to this product in real time. And we're gonna talk about uh, an interesting uh, example in, in the next slide. But for that reason, like NMS lib was okay for the batch processing, but when it came to the real time ones, there was a lot of uh, hiccups there and the engineers needed to do a lot of work in order to scale it up to run in real time. So it's not like uh, an easy task to do in real time. So is caching not a solution uh, from a, like not having to compute? The caching, it, caching helps, but but um, for example, one example could be like on the um, visual search. So on visual search, when the customer uploads an image and you want to now find uh, similar products to that image to satisfy to to answer the visual search question, in this case you're barely gonna find the same image uploaded by two customers. So in this case, caching will not be very helpful. So you have to run it in real time, every time, most, in most cases. <clears throat> All right. And then, yeah, this is the second example or use case I want to walk you guys through. And it is interesting. This is uh, 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 an example of what Karthik asked uh, earlier, which is how to combine text and images in order to, um, to find similar products. But in this case, we are not looking for just visually similar products. We're gonna look now at the problem we're trying to solve. It's called collection recommendations. This paper was published in uh, the RICSIS conference, ACM RICSIS 2019 in Copenhagen. And the paper title was product collection recommendations based on transaction data. So if we move to the next slide, so what is the definition of a collection in, uh, in the home improvement. Let's say you're shopping for um, to renovate your bathroom or your kitchen. And you like this faucet that we put as current product in the box. Now, when you like this faucet, if you are again working on a bathroom renovation project, in a bathroom renovation project, you're not buying just this faucet. You wanna buy everything that completes the look in your bathroom, which means you need also the towel bar, the towel ring, the shower head, the shower knob that actually match the style and the color and the color finishing of the anchor product. So I'm not here looking for similar faucets. I'm looking for complementary products that complement the function of this faucet <clears throat> to complete the look of my bathroom. That's like the why it's the different now problem and different use case. It's not, I need similar products. So what I need, I need harmony between those uh, products altogether, but they do different function. They are different products from different categories, but I want them to have harmony between them. They have similar style, color, color finishing, thing like that. And that's what we refer to as a collection. So if you think about this problem now, we have two things to think about. First of all, how should I identify those products that should form a collection? Which means, how should I know that if someone is looking for a faucet, I should also consider showing them shower head, shower knob, towel bar, and towel ring. 
based on a bathroom faucet. Someone needs to come up with that knowledge. Either a human needs to come tell the computer that if someone's shopping for a faucet, you need to show them the towel bar, the towel ring, and the shower head in the shower now. Or we need to extract that from the customer behavioral data. And that's what we actually did. So the paper, um, that's why it was talking about transactional data. What we did is we looked at the purchase patterns of the customers. And we figured out like when, when people shop for this product, in this case faucet, what are the other products from other categories that usually they shop for? And then we find out that people when they shop for a bathroom faucet and the transaction has multiple items, not just a single item transaction, they tend to shop a lot from the towel bar, towel ring category. They, they tend to shop a lot from the shower head, shower knob category. So you look at the you accumulate or you aggregate at the category level, the transactional data, and then you come up with that knowledge. Okay, if people are shopping from category X, then they also shop from category Y and Z with category X. And those three categories form a collection. So that's like step one. Step two then, okay, for the product X from the, the category A, what are the products from category Y that I should match with product X? And in this case, this is where it comes to the color, the color finishing, the style, or that how can I uh, identify the similarity between them? So it's an interesting uh, problem. And it, this was a manual process before the data science actually built a model to solve it. So which means like someone would be sitting in uh, in front of their computer and they would say, okay, I have this product from our catalog and they will go find another product from another category that match it. And then they'll put it together and they will call them collection uh, one, two, three. And then they will create another collection four, five, six and so on. So it was a manual process. And as you know, manual process, it never scale up, never scale up. But the good thing, the silver lining in that is that those manually curated and created collection those were the ones that we used as our uh, ground truth data set to train and validate and test our models uh, down the road. So if we move to the next slide. Uh, so, please so go ahead. Quick question. Uh, can we think of this, I mean, uh, in a conceptual level uh, as uh, the previous one was on understanding and building vectors for view similarity and this is for purchase similarity and because purchases are complementary or uh, can be complementary whereas views are very similar much more similar in terms of product and content and style and image as compared to purchase um, yes so this is this is kind of it's it leverages like the collaborative filtering aspects behind is in to some extent, which means right. like you look at what the other customers actually are shopping for a lot together. And then you learn from that pattern, what are the categories that should form a collection, that kind of step one in the process. At right? a core screen level, so at a category level, yes. and at a product level. Okay. Exactly. So we, we, we kind of aggregate up to the category level instead of the product level. And then from there, we try then to use the work that we did with the visual similar to find, okay, what are the products from those different categories now that visually, in this case, not they are similar, like uh, product with, with, with similar style, but they are different products, but they have the similar visual aspects, color, color finishing style. <clears throat> All right. And uh, I, okay, so here's like what the definition that uh, collection is, is uh, what we try to do is now we try to find out, okay, how can we identify like the uh, visual similarity in this case? Because they're not the same product, they're different products. And we figured out that relying on the images only was not the best solution. Some items or some uh, keywords mentioned in the description and the title sometimes helped in describing how this product looked like. And those like, aspects in the description, the product title and description, the text, once we enrich the, the representation of the image with those, it's actually uh, 
uh, shows or deliver much better results than just re relying or leveraging the images only. And we're gonna sh show you the, the pipeline in the next slide. So if you go to the next slide, here's for example, a different example from a different, totally different category, which is like the patio furniture. In the patio furniture, how would you tell if this anchor product, the chair that you see there, is part of a collection or not? And if it is part of a collection, what are the other products that form a collection with it? So what we did is we take actually the, um, we compute the visual features of all the images from the categories that we identified as the categories that form a collection based on the purchase pattern. And then we take, we train a bi-directional LSTM model to actually find the similarity on the text that tells you, for example, the, the brand, the model, like the, all those uh, important features that usually are mentioned in the text, in the product attributes and description, those tend to actually uh, be very important when you identify what end up in the same collection, what is not. So there is, in this case, there, is, there are features extracted from the image and there are features extracted from the text. And that's why we have this bi-directional LSTM deep learning model. And we have the, uh, the image, the features. And then after that, once you have those like embedding vector representation that represent the text or the, the, the textual features of the product and a vector represent the visual features of the product, then you try to use those two vectors now together to tell you if product X is or should belong to the same collection as a product Y or not, if they form a collection together. So if we go to the next slide, we're gonna highlight in the next slide the design of this bi-directional LSTM, where you take the product A title and description, this case faucet, and you take product B title and description. And again, when you feed them into this uh, bi-directional LSTM, then at the end, the network is was trained using the manually labeled and curated, sorry, um, and created collection. It was trained based on using those uh, collections to tell if those two products belong to the same collection or not. So after the training phase, if I give product A and product B to this network based on the title and description, it should tell me if those two products have a good uh, chance to be in the same collection or not, right? Uh, and, 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 and it's learned that from the uh, create, manually created collection because if, if in the cre manually created collection, it turns out that the model needs to be the same, the model number, the, the brand needs to be the same, you know, the, the, all these rules that we don't know all of them. Uh, if it turns out that it learned that from the text, then it's gonna apply it then for the unseen uh, products uh, or examples when, it's, when, they are, when they are feeded into this network. So this is the part that actually generate the text similarity between the two different products in order to know if they should form a collection or not. And then if we move next to know to how we extract it. This, this is interesting because this work was done before we built the visual similarity. And what happened is that it turned out that actually going back to a traditional computer vision technique, which is the mean adaptive threshold for the uh, color histogram tends to perform better than uh, the ResNet, for example. We try to use the uh, a network that was trained on ImageNet, but actually it turned out that using this color histogram mean adaptive threshold tends to perform better than even leveraging at that point a uh, network that was trained on the ImageNet. And the reason is because if you look at the example here, for example, this bench, the white one, when we use the pre-trained network and we wanted to see what are the images that it would return as uh, similar to this one, it returned the other benches, chairs. So yes, from like the concept, they are all chairs or benches, that's right. They're similar, but what we're looking for is I want the product that has the same color, color finishing style. And that was not what the, the um, image net network was trained for. So that's why it did not actually serve that purpose. So when we switch back to the mean adaptive threshold from the computer vision traditional techniques, it worked perfectly for this purpose. 
So that's what we end up using to generate the visual representation of the image or of the product. All right, so if we move to the next slide, this, is, this shows you from the research paper that we published um, the difference between using the visual features only versus visual plastics, the multimodal learning. And you can see like the, the blue, which is the visual features only. If you only rely on the images to identify the collections, you are not getting uh, as good results as when you use both visual embeddings and text embedding, which was an interesting finding uh, from this work as well. And then if we go to the next slide, this is an example of how we combine the scores, similarity score between the visual representation and the text representation. So it's weighted score, right? Um, which means if you, for example, take the power tools. In the power tools, the text features, the text, sim the text representation is actually tend to be more important than the visual representation because in the power tools, I really don't care about like the, the color, color style. It, it's a power tool, like a drill and, and a hammer. Like I don't really care about that. What I care about, like, do they have the same brand? Do they have the same model number? Do they have the same, especially if they have like, the, if they use battery platform, do they have the same voltage because they need to use the same battery platform, right? In order to generate a collection for the power tools, text embeddings or text similarity is more important than visual similarity. But when it comes to the kitchen or bathroom or, or furniture, like the visual is more important than the text. So that's why we designed it this way. So you can play with those weights based on the category. Um, and then you can decide which uh, representation is more important than the other one. So this is how we end up combining the scores. Now, if we move to the next slide, this is an example of sample results that came out of that work. So as you can see here, this faucet at the top, this is the anchor product. The model actually identified all these items in the uh, bottom as collection with this one. So if someone is shopping for this, you can show them all these items to form a collection to complete their bathroom block. And as you can see, there is actually harmony between all the items and the anchor product. So this is an, an interesting example of how the algorithm was able to identify all the products that can form a collection with this product using that technique of leveraging the text and the images. All right, any question before we move to the third project? Go ahead. Yeah, actually I encourage uh, our participants of the lecture to also ask questions if you have any. Yes, please. So one, uh, one question that I just had uh, from the first section was when you were combining um, the, uh, uh, the traditional computer vision features with uh, deep learning features. Uh, is it, like, did you consider having a skip uh, connection for the computer vision features, uh, the traditional features, so they could show up at the same layer as the ones that we have defined features from the deep learning model? and then pass it through some more fully connected layers. So it kind of mimics the XG boost kind of uh, setup that you had. Uh, yeah, that, that's interesting. No, I don't think we, we've tried that or considered that, but that's, that, that could work, yeah. That's a very interesting idea. All right, go ahead. Uh, from one of the earlier sections. Um, so you, you mentioned about active learning. Um, so how are you choosing the like most interesting images to sample? Are you use like a metric like entropy or is there any other way you go about it? Yeah, like you start with random, right? You randomly select at the beginning, the first round, the images. But then after that, yes, you kind of uh, calculate the entropy and you see what are the classes that actually struggle the most in the classification. And then based on those, then you select, you try to label more images uh, from that class on for the next round of training. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, good. Um, then Catbird is a very interesting um, research collaboration project that we did with uh, 
Kennesaw State University. Kennesaw State University was one of the first that started a PhD data science program. Um, and uh, we partnered with them on one of the, it is, it is based in Atlanta, actually in our backyard when I was at Home Depot, like it's just a few miles from the uh, Home Depot headquarters. So we established partnership with them on the data science. And in that partnership, what we wanted to do is we wanted to train a domain specific language model um, that can be leveraged for some of the NLP tasks. For example, the one I described about the collection recommendation to measure the similarity between the title and description of products, right? Uh, uh, if we try to use BERT, the generic BERT, um, the, 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 the hypothesis was that like, BERT is great, but when you have domain-specific jargon and, and knowledge, then you need a domain-specific language model. And that was a hypothesis. We wanted to test it and see, does it, is it true that if you have a, a domain that has its own uh, you know, jargon and, and, and its own uh, terms and terminology, is it better to have a domain-specific language model? So this is cat bird, which is catalog, basically cat refers to the catalog, catalog bird, which is like the, for the, for any e-commerce, like when they have a catalog of products, all, if you take all the job of all the products, titles and description, and you train a domain specific language model, what should you expect? So if we uh, move to the next slide, you will see that this is not like, uh, uh, this is nothing new to anyone that the pre-trained language models uh, made a lot of like uh, many breakthrough. Uh, Elmo or BERT, like they, they really like uh, uh, transformed the way that we think of how NLP, sh uh, how NLP should work and, and, and made like uh, outstanding progress in, in the NLP tasks. And it is, because of that, like because due to its simplicity and superior performance over the other models, BERT has emerged as the very powerful technique, which everyone, if you mention NLP in front of anyone, the first model they would recommend, like go use BERT. Well, okay, great. But if you move to the next slide, some domains actually prove that if you train domain specific BERT language model, it can actually outperform BERT. And we have like Cybert, which is the biomedical and computer science literature corpus. It was trained on that. And it, it is like a, a domain specific language model. Uh, Finbert, a domain specific language model for financial services uh, text. A Biobert, a domain specific for biomedical literature. Clinical Bert from the clinical notes. So this is why, this is what inspired this work. We wanted to see if we train something for home improvement uh, domain, should we expect like better results in the downstream NLP tasks? And this is uh, what we found. If we move to the next slide, in this slide, you see actually how we uh, train the cat bird. So we have in, if you take like the um, product information page, again, if you take the title uh, of, of a product, you will see that it's like a semi-structured like data, which means like there's like tags. Here's the ID of the product. Here's the title, right? Here is the brand. Here's the uh, L1 category. Here's the L2 category. Here's the L3 category. So you can think about it as like a, a, a semi-structured data as XML, right? So given that, what we wanted to do is we wanted to incrementally train the BERT model, domain specific mo uh, BERT model by, okay, I'm gonna start with training on, uh, if we move to the next slide, it's better to, to show with the example. So here it is. So what I wanna do is, okay, let's start with taking the product title and train the V0 of the cat BERT. Then after that, take that model and then train that model incrementally now on the product brands. So it learned the representation of titles. Then after that, you enrich it with the brands and then you train the same model again and you generate the version one of that model. Then you take that version one and then you train it again using now the product taxonomy, L1, L2, L3. So you increment the like in introducing new kind of vocabulary based on the, the uh, tag 
to the BERT model and you generate a new model and then you train it incrementally on the next thing and you train it and, and then you see which uh, every time you introduce a new kind of knowledge or a new vocabulary to the BERT model, you see how it improves the performance of the model. So if we move to the next slide, here are some of the uh, results that was published in that research paper. So it turns out that yes, you can tell from the numbers here that every time you introduce a new vocabulary, if you look at the uh, yellow column here, column one. So when you just introduce the product title, the accuracy is 63%, the precision at K, uh, precision at, at one in this case. And then version one, it is after you introduce, after the title, you introduce the brand, it's 68%. 1.1 didn't help much. 1.2 after you introduce, I think, the uh, category, which is the L1 category, it become like the accuracy 75%. And then if, if you introduce the category level two, it becomes 77% and so on. So it proved that if you train it in an incremental way, which means like you start with the basic knowledge, then you start to enrich the knowledge with a more, with more uh, structured knowledge down the road, it keeps improving the model. And if you compare these results with the result of the tip of what the generic birth, the original birth model, you see that the, gener the general birth model actually, the maximum accuracy it reached was 71% precision at one, while here we're talking about 77% using the domain specific. So it approved the two hypotheses, which is domain specific outperform the generic birth. That's, that's one thing. And the second thing is that the incremental training is actually benefiting the model. The model gets trained or, or, or learned faster, if you like, introduce semi-structured knowledge into the model in an incremental way. Um, so this model that was trained here, as I said, that was like uh, published earlier this year, this work. So the, the plan is that this model will be then used for the downstream NLP tasks, similar to the one that we just described with the collection recommendations. So instead of using the LSTM to measure the uh, similarity between product A and product B title and description, you're gonna use now this cat bird to measure the similarity between those two products. And that's, um, that's one use case. Other use cases on the search side if you take, generate the embeddings of the query and you want to match it with the products that match the query, then generating the embeddings using cat BERT is, is uh, uh, supposed to perform better than using the uh, BERT or any other language model. Any question? Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, basic clarification. What's the training, a typical training example look like for cat BERT? Um, oh, it's, uh, it's, it's basically the, um, that's similar to XML that we showed you, right? And then what you try to do is you try then to uh, predict like the, the rest of the title or you try to predict the rest of the description of the product, you know? So you take away some words from the description and then you try to complete them. Mm -hmm. Any other question? All right, let's move forward. All right, this is the interesting work, which um, I described at the beginning about where do you need real-time KNN? And this is an example of where do you need real-time KNN recommendation, session-based recommendation. So if you move to the next slides, just want to slide about this because this was um, still like a project under development, um, but it get published now. So this, this work, was inspired by a paper that was published at Europe's 2017 by Viswani and others. Here, what, what you want to do is when customers come into the website, they start shopping, for example, and they looked at a faucet. Then after the faucet, they moved to look at uh, another kitchen faucet. And then after that, they moved and looked at the power tool. And after that, they moved from the power tool and they looked at tiles, right? So this sequence of actions that happen in the, uh, in the session, how can we learn from the sequence of actions that happen in the session 
So when a Nix, when the when the when the new customer when a new customer comes to the website and start looking for faucet, then in the recommendation of that inform product information page, we should learn like okay, based on the sequence that we have seen in the past, most likely the customer is going to look after that to a kitchen faucet. And then after the kitchen faucet, most likely they're gonna look at. So basically you try to predict what is the next item which the customer is gonna look at in the session, right? Now, what you wanna do is you wanna then try to be uh, kind of helpful by showing the customer what they should what they should look at next as a recommendation, you know? And then this is not just for uh for, for one use case but there are many others for example when the customer leave the website let's say the customer purchased a faucet and they left the website to re-engage them in order to come back via recommendation emails when you send them a recommendation email what should you put in that recommendation email so based on what they purchased and based on what we learned in that sequence we know that after faucet people come back to buy tile or they come back to to buy power tool because they need to install that faucet so in the recommendation email that you send them after 24 hours or after 48 hours you need to know what to send them and what to send them comes from what you learn from this model so in the real time use case while the customer in the session if you detect the customer at any point in their session based on their pattern of what they already viewed as of now you need to predict what is next and you need to show them that as a recommendation. On the offline mode, after the customer leaves the website, you need to use that model to predict what they must like most likely come back to purchase. And then you send them that as a recommendation email. You know, so those are like the use cases of this model. And it is very interesting uh, model and very complicated one um, that actually uh, required a lot of uh, of uh, tuning to the to the uh, deep learning models in order to work that way. But this is the idea of this, uh, this uh, session-based recommendation. And that's where we said like, if this is the case, you, let's say you generated the embeddings of the first three actions of the session. And you have now a vector that represents those first three actions, which in this case means like the first three products the customer viewed in the session. Now take that vector representation, you need now to know which products you should recommend as an X, right, from this network. So now you need to take that vector and you need to do Canon against millions of products you have in your catalog to know which product you should show as a recommendation next. And that needs to happen in real time. That's where the Canon real time become crucial. And that's why I like the NMS lib as is will not work this way because it takes longer than the time needed for real time and you have to find uh, uh, other libraries that work for real time. But yeah, but, but this is an example of where you have to apply KNN in real time for the session-based recommendation. Any question about this work? So uh, I, I think I'll ask it on behalf of the class is uh, mm -hmm. we have spoken about when we scale uh, recommendation systems that uh, inference time becomes an uh, important thing to consider, yes. especially like for session-based recommendations. So in this context, I had a couple of questions. Is this model deployed? And if so, did you consider, did you have to optimize for latency uh, of, you know, refreshing the recommendations as customers add yeah. or, you know, purchase new things? Yes, I can tell you, like, designing the model was probably not as complicated as deploying the model. Because deploying the model was the real challenging part, because you have to tune it to make sure that it, the inference happen in, in, as I said, like less than 30, 35 milliseconds. And the, NL, the Canon also happened within that time. So Canon, part of that inference time, like everything, generating the embeddings, updating the embedding, generating the embeddings, and making the Canon all needs to happen within 35 milliseconds. And that's why like the model was like back and forth between data science and engineering team multiple times in order to tune it to work within that latency, accepted latency, which is within 35 milliseconds, everything should be done from A to Z. So it was, yeah, it was very, very complicated. I can't tell you. And again, like last time, uh, uh, if, if we could cache any embeddings, we would do that, right? But it, right. because you have new products, again, you'd have to go through this, these uh, transformer layers and that itself is 
expensive and then you have to do KNN as well. Right, right, exactly. Whenever like the, um, whenever you work at the user level or a session level, caching become like kind of uh, helpless because every user has different pattern of shopping. So they will have different like order of sequence of actions. And then the cached embeddings will not match in this case, in most cases. But whenever it is item based, it is easier because whenever it's item based, you have a limited items in, in your catalog. So whenever it's item based, you can benefit a lot from caching. But whenever it is user based or session based, caching become less and you have to come up with a lot of, you know, uh, hack, hacky ways in order to kind of speed up some of those uh, things. And, and sometimes like, for example, if it is user based, like, should I really care about the users who are not active in the last six months? Because if I want to consider all the users, it's going to be like massive. I, I cannot like generate embeddings for all the users. But I would say maybe the users who are active in the last, you know, uh, 60 days or in the last uh, 30 days, those are the only users I care about in order to cache their embeddings for for the for the uh, for the future usage. <clears throat> so that's how you can, you have to kind of think of hacky ways or some some tricks in order to make the cache works for if you work with the user base or with, with session base, because it's the scale is huge. You cannot just uh, cache everything. And the question is, even if you cache, like, do you think you're gonna benefit from the cache? Do you think that a user who, was, who didn't visit in the last six months will come tomorrow? So you have to cache their embeddings in their last session in order to, in order to use it. So if you wanna cache everything, it's a disaster from the cost perspective. And if you don't want to cache, except like a little bit, then you're going to struggle with the latency and then become slow system. So you need to find that balance. Like, where is that sweet spot of which, what, what is the right threshold in order to stop caching at that point? So, yeah. But whenever, whenever it is item-based, it is much easier to manage. Um, excuse me, um, Dr. Kelefe, uh, I have a question regarding the uh, uh, this diagram. Uh, like, what is the difference between like the T1, T2, and like the rest of the uh, number of Ts? Because I see that T1 and T2, uh, like T1, it passes through like the transformer encoder, but it doesn't link the item to the polling, and like T2, it passes directly by the transform encoder and goes directly to the pooling and uh, while the rest they like follow a sequence that like going through the encoder and then going to the pooling so i was wondering if there's like uh like a specific difference of like the first two uh tiers of uh, like this diagram that's a great question and unfortunately i'm not really sure why oh. that was uh, designed this way, but um, th there's in from the logic perspective of the model itself, there shouldn't be any difference. All the items are the similar. So the first item needs to be embedded, and then you take it and then you enrich it with the embeddings of the second item. So the two items now generate, you kind of combine them, either averaging or what, or concatenating, and you generate then the embeddings that represent both of them now. And then same thing with the update with, when you see the third item, you update the vector now with the embeddings of the third item by averaging that and have one vector. So at any point, you should have one vector that represents all the previous items that you viewed in the session. And then what you try to do is to predict what are the next items that the, that the customers most likely will engage with or interact with. But if it is not, if it is confusing here and how we, uh, how it is depicted in this image, uh, maybe uh, it's just based on how, the arrows appear in the slide or things, but yeah, I'm not sure oh. if there is a reason for that. Oh, no, uh, yeah, your, your explanation was very clear. Uh, appreciate it, Dr. Kalife. Sure. Yeah, maybe it's it's about when you increment a new product, then how do you transform the embedding? I think if you already know which products you want to embed, then it's easy, you just pass it through the transformer, yeah. but you already had an embedding, then how do you append it or uh, change yeah. it? Right, that's the incremental aspect. Yep, could be. All right, now to the shoppable images. Shoppable images, basically the idea here is um, 
again, this is paper that was published at WACV 2021 under the title Visually Compatible Home Decor Recommendation Using Object Detection and awesome. Product Matching. So if we go to just to show you the example in, in real life, like what, how, what do we mean by showable images? So if you are on the Home Depot app, for example, and you look at um, this image of uh, this picture of a room that has a chair, that has a lamp, that has a, an end table or, or a cabin, and you like really some of those products in the image. The question is, instead of going and trying to search for those products by describing how, what is the product, with a shoppable image, what you, what you do is basically, you can just click on the product in the image that you like, and we're gonna show you the products that we have in the catalog that actually match the product that you see in the image, okay? So you basically take a lifestyle image or, or a scene image, and you convert that into a shoppable image by making the products within that image become clickable and shoppable, which means once you click on it, you can see the products that match it in the catalog and you can buy or purchase or shop for those products. Now, how to do that? That's the question. It is kind of a two phases process. In the first phase, you need to detect the products within the image that actually represent a product that exists in the catalog. So if we move to the next slide, and that's what we refer to as the object detection, right? So you need to detect the objects in the image. And then if we move to the next slide, yeah. Exactly, so what you do here is you try to detect the image from within the scene, the products from within the scene. And once you detect those objects or those products within the, the scene, then you extract those products. You identify them, you extract those products from, and then once you extract them, then what you do is you try then to train um, an, uh, an uh, similar to the visually similar a, a network that actually try to search for this product that you extracted from the image in our catalog and find similar products within the catalog. So that's why there's two phases. Object detection is phase one and then visual search. So once you detect the object, you need to extract that kind of object from uh, the image and then you need to take it and conduct a search, visual search in this case, for similar products that have similar images in our catalog in order to identify which products we host or we hold in our catalog that actually match this object that you detected in the image. So if we move to the next slide, this is basically how it works. And this is kind of also how you train the model because you need annotators first to annotate those objects. So then uh, the object detection model can actually take a lifestyle image like this and detect that this is a chandelier, this is like a throw pillow, this is a table, a pole, blah, blah, blah. And then once the object detection model works fine and identify those objects, then you can take those objects out of the image and then you can conduct a visual search to identify the similar products that exist in our catalog. This uh, work again, it was published and it's also is live on the uh, app and the website of Home Depot. And that was a very interesting and helpful feature for the customers. Because people sometimes just look at this lifestyle image like in this one scene image and you really like your products there, but you don't wanna go ahead and like start describing them in the search box and search for them. It is better to just click on the product that you like and see if uh, there are similar products in the catalog. Mm -hmm. So is the motivation, some uh, understanding the motivation for shoppable images is while you're shopping in person or in a store, you the, this is a tool that can aid you to the right product that you're looking at based on what you're showing right now. Uh, and it can leverage uh, view similarity and also the collection recommendations that you dis described earlier, right? So maybe uh, you 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 can search across both, right? And you know get get a collection or get a get some oh, yeah. of different colors or whatever. Uh, yeah. Well, once you identify a similar product in the catalog to a product that you like in the image, 
then that product in the catalog will have the collection. Mm -hmm. If it belongs to a collection, it will have the similar uh, products from the visually similar. So you can benefit from all the recommendation modules that we offer with the product. But the mm -hmm. step one is you have to identify that is this a product something that we that we have in our catalog, that we have a, a similar product to it in our catalog. Once you reach to that product, then you can benefit from all the other recommendation models that we have. Any other question? Okay. Um, we move next. All right, personalized project recommendation. Another interesting work. This is different because we talked about the product recommendation as of now, right? So there is a product we want to either show similar, visually similar products, or we want to show collection, or we want to detect the, the project, the product in an image, and then make it uh, search for similar for, for it in our catalog. But this is about the content, and that's why this is different. This is about content. So at, on the website at Home Depot, if you are a DIYer and you work on a garden project. You don't know how to do things. So the first thing you want to know is how to, right? How to install ceiling fan if you are installing ceiling fan. Uh, how to plant, uh, I don't know, like a, a, a flower or something because you don't know how to do that. Um, how to stitch a hole in a wall, right? So those, we call them project guides, exist over the website to help the DIYer uh, answer the how question, which usually when you go to a store and you talk to an associate at the Home Depot store, you ask, hey, I would like to install a scenic fan. I'm buying scenic fan. I would like to install, how should I do that? And then the usually the um, store associate will walk you through the process and will uh, help you to find all the items, tools, and materials that you need to install the ceiling fan. On the digital side now, how can we do the same thing? How can you uh, do that digitally? Which means if someone is, is, is looking for a scenic fan, how can you tell them that you need uh, this and that and that part of, to, of, of tools and materials to, to install the scenic fan? And those are the steps that you need to take. That's why there are project guides. Those are content, they're not products, right? The question becomes now, when someone land on Home Depot site and they start shopping, how can we identify which project guides they will benefit from and show those project guides to them as recommendation? So how would you know if someone is working on a garden project or on uh, stitching a hole in a wall project or installing a ceiling fan project, right? There are sometimes driving products, which means if someone's buying ceiling fan, I can't tell they need how to install ceiling fan, but some projects, they don't have that driving product because if, if you are working on stitching a hole in a wall, like what is the driving product there, right? So, but there are like a, a sequence of products that if you are looking for at, and if you are putting in your cart now, most likely you're working on this project. So I should show you a project guide how to stitch a hole in a wall, right? Same thing with the gardening. And this is what this uh, work is about. It's how to recommend project guides to the customers that actually fit their need and answer the questions in their mind and match their intent of what they're working on now without explicitly waiting the customer to ask the question how to. So interesting, uh, what, what we do is, if we go to the next slide in this work, what you do is, again, you look at the sequence of actions, the shopping pattern. And from that, the customer looked at packing tape, uh, bubble wrap, moving boxes, right? All these products now together as a pattern represent a project. They means that the customer is working on something. And that's how uh, basically it, it, it works. So basically we take the sequence of items which the customer viewed or add to cart, and then you generate an embedding. So basically you take that sequence and you generate an embedding using neural network. And then on the other hand, you have the guide 
content, the project guide content, the text, right? So you take the text of the project guide and you generate embeddings and you map them to the same latent space because you generate the embedding from the same network. And then in this case, when they are mapped to the same latent space, then you know if those products, the sequence of products happen, then most likely the customer is working on the best boxes for moving, how to pack to, um, for a move, the first project guide, right? So if this sequence happen, the best project guide to recommend is how to pack for a move. If another sequence of, of, of products happen, then the best guide would be how to install ceiling fan. Another sequence happen, the best guide would be how to uh, how to stitch a hole in a wall and so on. So this is how you like match between content and sequence of actions by using the neural network or the uh, deep learning. By mapping them to the same Latin space, then if I see this sequence of actions, this is the best guide. If I see that sequence of actions, that's the best project guide and so on. So that's the idea of this uh, of this work. Questions? Yeah, uh, so uh, the motivation for this project, uh, does it, is it customer retention? Is it uh, an uptick in purchases? Or does it, do, do these uh, widgets for DIY guides get coupled with other things that they could purchase in a collection that this guide is also alluding to? Like, do you, did you see like those kind of, uh, you know, benefits of uh, doing this recommendation? It's mainly the customer satisfaction. And the reason is the following. DIYers, when they usually go shop uh, for a project, they tend to do multiple visits to the store or multiple orders because they figure out after they start working the project that they forgot something, right? And all of us face the same problem, I think, when we start to work on any uh, project at home. So. You go purchase uh, the packing tape, and then you figure out, oh, we forgot the bubble wrap. Then you go back to bring the bubble wrap, or you order the bubble wrap. And then you bring it, and you figure out, oh, we don't have moving boxes. And you have to order moving boxes. This is as simple as this for the moving stuff. But when it comes to the other project, bigger project, it is worse. It becomes a, a very big problem. So for the customer satisfaction, this project guide recommendation came into the picture because customers, when we figure out they're working on a project, they don't know that Home Depot actually has a project guide. Many people don't know Home Depot has project guides. So the idea here was that once we identify that there is a project going on when the customers start shopping, we want to show them the project guide recommendation. So they, oh my, oh wow. So Home Depot has the how-to. So they click on the how-to and in the how-to, the project guide tells them what tools and materials they need to complete the project. So. In this case, they will learn about what they need and they will learn about the difficulty level of the project before they actually you know, get trapped into the project. If it is, for example, a difficult and big project. So the project guide is very informative. It tells you how difficult is the project. Is it for beginner, intermediate, advanced DIYers? It tells you the estimated time to complete the project. It gives you the tools and materials that you need. Very, very informative, uh, uh, very informative guides. So that's why it's mainly focused, was focused on the customer satisfaction to make sure the customers actually get all the information they need, get everything they need in less number of visits, as this as possible number of visits to the store or, or, or uh, online. So that was the whole idea of this. Any other question? All right. Uh, last but not least, I know we, uh, so we're reaching the end of the time, but product review summarization, this is uh, something different. Again, this was published um, as uh, at, at the SIG IR 20, one of the, the e-com workshop there. Um, and if, if we want to summarize here, what happened is that we have thousands of customer reviews on for each product. The question was, okay, well, when the customer come to a product page. I don't think any of us would like to go and read thousands of reviews in order to know what is good and what is bad about the product, right? We don't have time for that. Um, so what this project is was about is can we take all the reviews about the product and summarize the pros and cons 
that were mentioned in those reviews, right? So they're using the sentiment analysis, you know, the, pro, the positive and negative feedback, but then out of that, you need to know what is the aspect which the customer was talking positively or negatively about in this product. If it is a refrigerator, people were talking positively about the space, how spacious is this refrigerator. But people were talking negatively about reliability of this refrigerator. It, it's, it is not reliable, it broke down, blah, 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 right? So you need to highlight what is positive and what is negative and summarize that to the user. Instead of waiting the user to go skim across thousands of reviews in order to extract that piece of knowledge. So that's the idea of this project. And if we go to the, quickly, we're gonna just look at, uh, those are some statistics about the number of reviews and sentences in, in those reviews in different categories. Um, if we go next. So this is basically what uh, like the aspect extraction workflow look like. So you start with the review text, uh, the, the review from the customer, and then you try to identify the explicit aspect, and then you identify implicit aspect, and then you take the semantic merging, and then you mapping corresponding implicit and explicit aspects, and then you run the sentiment analysis on top of that, and then you know this aspect people talk positively about it, or this aspect people talk negatively about it. And then if we move next, this is kind of uh, an, the aspect merging, how it's done, it is semantic clustering using the uh, open source uh, library, uh, open source algorithm use from Google, the universal sentence encoder, <clears throat> and then the explicit aspect mapping using coordinates. So this is how you identify the aspects. And then if we move next, Again, uh, what we used to do the sentiment analysis, as you see, one version of BERT was used here, Roberta. Um, so gated Roberta generated the best results compared to the other uh, versions of Roberta. Um, and then all I want to go is basically, if you go next, this is how it appears in production. So if you go to the customer reviews, uh, you will see that um, pros, if you see the, uh, at the bottom of the image, pros, you see that people talk in pros about installation, about design, about the price, about cleanup. Cons, people were talking negatively about the door of this uh, microwave, GE microwave, for example. So this is basically summarized to the customer what is good, what's what's bad about the product instead of going through all the reviews in an automated way. And once we uh, put those, the engagement with the customer reviews with this, with this summarization increased 16% by 16%, which was great improvement. All right, that's all I have to share with you all guys for today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk. And um, if you have more questions, we have still a few minutes. Please feel free to ask the questions. Hi, I have a quick question. So you mentioned that um, customer engagement went up 16%, but do you know of any of the stats of like whether a product was sold more because maybe the cons weren't as like freely <laughs> accessible before and now it's highlighted on the front page? Uh, I don't think we as the designers would look at that. Probably the product team would look at that. Uh, not us, but yeah, I'm, I'm not uh, aware that we have done such analysis to see if uh, showing the pros and cons impacted. However, I think if the, um, there was a negative impact on the, uh, on the sales or, or on the revenue in general, those things usually like get uh, flagged early enough and we could have been noticed that there is something going on wrong that impacted negatively the revenue. So I assume there is no negative impact for sure. But if there is positive impact in the revenue, blah, 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 then um, uh, I'm not aware of that. So uh, there is some uh, confounding factor here, right? Like if, if we just introduce pros and cons and just put up some average, you know, uh, mm. boxes in there, would there still be more engagement because you're providing pros and cons and people like that format? 
like and then there's on top of that you're actually digging in and making sure it's a it's a proper pro and a proper con right so do people just like more information and that's why there's more engagement uh, i mean th that's a confounding factor right i mean just uh yeah right right yeah i think again like the measurement of before and after the engagement was basically just to see uh showing additional information like the pros and cons in a in in a clean way where you tell the customer exactly what are the pros and cons does do, do we think the customer care or not or they don't care right mm -hmm. customers does do the customers care or not actually the customers actually care because once you share them additional uh, piece of information they actually engage with that additional piece of information so that was like the the, the whole idea of measuring the impact before and after no, I'm just saying like, uh, if, I mean, we use a summary, you use summarization model to actually understand mm -hmm. and, you know, have the tags also appropriate. But if you just put in some, you know, some other uh, simpler model, but had these, had, had this pros and cons kind of a setup, would you still have had more engagement? Because people yeah, just really like more information. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> good question. Yep. But, but yeah, obviously this probably made a lot of sense for them. So, right, right. Oh, hi, Doctor Shader. Um, I just have a pretty general question. So, um, in the e-commerce field, um, do you think um, like a, a recommending systems or classifying systems need to be interpretable, or as long as the accuracy are pretty uh, well, and then the model doesn't need need to be interpretable? Oh my God, it needs to be interpretable because this is one of the challenges when uh, you start using more and more, uh, relying more on deep learning is that if um, you receive question from the business leaders and the business partners and the stakeholders on why this thing appeared in the recommendation, why that thing does not appear in the recommendation, mm -hmm. We're usually in trouble. We have to dig a lot in order to find why, right? So if you build interpretable models, those are those discussions become much easier. And I can tell you, those discussions happen a lot. Believe me, a lot. Because especially in, in the e-commerce, like I don't know if you guys know about all the kind of uh, of, of the hierarchy with, within the uh, uh, retailers, but there are like category uh, managers and there are like merchants and the, those people like they are in charge of specific products in specific categories. And if their product is not selling well online, they come to you, they come after you, after the people who have the session of the recommender system to find out why my product is not showing up in the recommendation, why my product is not showing up in the search results in the first page or in the second page, or you know. Mm -hmm. So a lot, a lot of pressure on the teams that work on search and recommendation because those, as you know, like the the most uh the most powerful uh, interfaces or systems in the online business that drive sales and revenue. And for, for many of those people, like those two things always questionable, like why the product, my product is not showing on the first page, why my product is not showing me the recommendation. So you have to have answers. So if your models are not interpretable, you are in trouble because, <laughs> because then you have to go dig and find out why the deep learning actually dropped this and they didn't show that or show that and did not show that. So it's, 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 it's much better to build something interpretable. Got it. But sometimes I feel like, for example, the deep learning model like LSTM, sometimes it is hard to interpret what layers represent what. So, so yes. and now the models you showed just before, I think is uh, very complicated. And then, but are those deep learning models interpretable, you know, in just general sense, but not from like a data scientist um, view? Not yet. I can't tell you. That's what I'm saying. Like we, we, we faced a lot of trouble uh, after introducing <laughs> those deep learning models to answer many of those questions about like why the product X showing, why product Y is not showing. And we have to educate them first of all about like why deep learning is is powerful, but on the other hand, it is a black box, and you you need to understand that you you're getting you're getting the benefit of of much better accuracy and much better engaged customer engagement, blah blah blah. But you are losing the interpretability, um, mm -hmm. which hopefully gonna be solved soon with 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 all the efforts in the research community to make the deep learning models more interpretable. But you have to work on educating the business leaders and the business partners on why we cannot interpret the results when we use deep learning. 
Thank you so much for answering. Mm -hmm. So just to follow up on that, did you uh, did you have to have se a separate interpretable models uh, aside of deep learning that are maybe linear or something of that sort, like Lime or Equivalent to explain to uh, customers, uh, retailers? We we tried. Uh, as I said, it's not really easy, and there's no like uh, straight answer most of the time. But we have implemented some things that help us at least like know um, what contributes to the score that at the end uh, used to make a decision of what how we rank the stuff. And we try to split or separate like the retrieval from the ranking because the ranking we try to use only interpretable linear models so we can easily inter explain and interpret why this product was ranked above that product or so on and so forth. So we try to kind of separate the ranking from the retrieval. So less questions in the retrieval, tons of questions about the ranking. So we better have like linear models on the ranking side than on the retrieval side. That's pretty cool. Any other question, guys? All right. Well, it uh, was a pleasure talking to all of you today. It's 10.45 uh, p.m. on my side. So it's, it's, uh, it's a bit late, but uh, I was really uh, happy to be with all of you. Thank you for having me, Karthik, and thank you all for staying at the end, until the end of the lecture. Thank I see you. Some hands. Still, some people have questions. People are, people are clapping for you. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th thank you, Dr. Khalife, for joining us and uh, you know spending your valuable time. It's always good to. This is a professional master's program that we have, uh, and you know people taking recommender systems and other courses. So it's always useful to get an industry perspective, and we encourage that in our classes. But it's also great to hear directly from you know folks who have worked in this field. Uh, and from different companies. So yeah, really great uh, having you today. And uh, thank you for enlightening, enlightening, uh, en enlightening us with uh, so many different uh, themes and um, aspects of recommendations. Yeah. Appreciate it.